So Okay. Sorry for the so, jarring um, recording note. I just remembered that I wanted to record the panel. So apologies, continue, thank you. Okay, um, so I'll pass it along to Esther Ann. Good afternoon, everyone. In Tliwis, Esther Ann, Chkornaki Ig, Beskunu Gad Nil, Nudebeg Zibayig, Wigu Banawabskewi. My name is Esther. I'm, I'm Wabanaki. I am a uh, Passamaquoddy from Zibayig, and I live here at uh, Penobscot Community. And I uh, want to thank you all for being here today. As Heather said, it's <clears throat> whether you've seen the film for the first time or the tenth time, it's 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 a lot to take in. Um, so I, I appreciate you being here and showing up, and I hope you um, get your questions answered today. Luke. Sorry about that. Uh, hi, I'm Luke. I'm a I'm Wabanaki as well. I'm Malisey, Passamaquoddy, and Micmac. I'm registered in uh, the Holton Band Maliseets in Holton. Um, I'm a father, husband, and a qualified expert witness here in the state of Maine. And also, I just want to add as well, um, like Heather said, I'm. Um, I'm a, uh, I guess, a byproduct of, of the scoop and such back in the 60s. Uh, my mom and about eight, no, I think five or six relatives were scooped up, put into foster care due to a, a tragic accident of alcohol poisoning. Uh, and then from there, uh, I, my father was a product of the other side of the, of the system, the, um, the law side. So, yeah. So. I'm here. Resiliency is in our, in our blood, and I think that's a, I think that's one of the things I think we can we can speak about as a, as Wabanaki is our resiliency. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Augustine. I'm a member of the Rooster County Band of Micmacs. Um, here in Maine, as well as the Elspoktok First Nations up in New Brunswick, Canada. Um, I am the assistant director, um, excuse me, I am the director of uh, social services for the Penobscot Nation, and I am also a product of the child welfare system. Um, I grew up in child welfare uh, from the age of two, um, and I aged out of foster care at the age of 21. So I do bring that perspective as well as uh, perspective of um, running our child welfare department for the Penobscot Nation. And I also had the opportunity to work for the state of Maine child welfare system uh, for four years. So I look forward to uh, talking and answering questions today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, so being that we have, um, you know, just a little over 20 minutes here um, together, I want to just open it right up like and and please don't be shy uh, you know ask ask any question that comes into your mind there's <clears throat> all questions are good so um if i'm not sure how this is set up if it's best to just unmute or if you want to put your question in the chat whatever whatever you think but we we want to open it up So in our events, folks have used chat a lot for this. So feel free, everyone, if you have a question to drop it into the chat. Um, there's also a reaction button at the bottom. If you wanna raise your hand and come off of mute, you can ask a question. And um, as we all know, I love asking questions. So uh, if there aren't any, oh, we see, we have one um, that just popped up. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait, go ahead. Okay. Iris Allen asks, are there Native American schools in, still in existence today? Um, if, if you're referring to like Native American residential schools, um, I, no, they're not in existence um, now. It, it, it's sort of like what's happened with the residential schools took like it, it shifted where they stopped sending the kids to residential schools. But then the next wave of sort of like genocide was taking the children and putting them into foster care. 
Um, so it, it, it just, it looks different. It's not residential schools, it's, it's something else. Okay, wow, they're coming in rapid fire. Let me, let me. <laughs> um, were there recommendations from the TRC report? Who wants to take that? What is the, what is the question about it the recommendations? Recommendations from the TRC report. So um, you can, <clears throat> Heather, maybe you want to put the uh, website in the chat, but they issued a report called Beyond the Mandate. Probably can't see it because everything's blurred. But um, on Wabanaki Reach's website, you can you can download the report and you can also down uh, see the findings and recommendations. In total, there were 19 findings and 14 recommendations. And half of those recommendations were really geared um, specific to child welfare. And those have been um, implemented and are in different stages of implementation within the ICWA work group, which is uh, Michael serves on the ICWA work group. I facilitate that group. It's the, the group that originally came together in 1999 and started this whole process. Um, and the other recommendations are things that really take more of a collective effort. Um, especially number one, respect tribal sovereignty and commit to resolve and uphold federal, state, and tribal jurisdictions and protocols at both state and local levels. Um, that is that is a long haul. That's not something that is an easy box to check, especially here in the state of Maine, where we have quite a unique history with the Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act and the land claims, um, <clears throat> which is why Wabanaki reaches in embarking on a new truth telling project around the Maine Indian Claim Settlement Act um, of 1980. So yes, there are recommendations and Wabanaki Reach is the organization. I mean, we're a product of um, this process. We created this process and we were committed to ensuring that those recommendations had some life and they didn't just sit on a shelf somewhere. So that is, um, that's a <clears throat> part of our work is to make sure they, they are implemented. Thank you, Esther. Yeah, I just put the um, Wabanaki Reach website into the chat. So please ha have a look, feel free. There's a lot of resources beyond just uh, what's on the TRC recommendations and findings. Um, so there's a question specifically for Michael. Um, Oh gosh, they came in so fast. I kind of lost my place. Um, uh, asking about, um, do you know what percentage of Native American children are placed outside of the homes? I mean, probably not an easy figure to just know, but. It varies um, per state. Um, there, to this day, uh, Native American children are disproportionately taken from homes, um, ranging from, um, I think the last thing that I saw was between five and 7% to um, up to 26% um, increase just um, being placed, removed from their biological homes. Um, I know as a, um, the Penobscot Nation, we run our own child welfare program um, and we do try um, and follow the guidance of ICWA. We're not mandated to follow ICWA uh, because we run our own child welfare program. But one of our high priorities is to keep the children with the family, um, whether the family is native or non-native. Um, we, our, our first preference is with family. Could I, could I say something? Um, the second finding of the Truth Commission was that Wabanaki, uh, identifying Wabanaki children at intake at OCFS continues to be a problem. In fact, in um, up to 53% of the cases in 2006 and 2009, children's uh, ancestry was not verified. So there, you know, there are statistics, numbers of children who are in care, and then there's also an issue that I suspect might be across the country of um, identifying children that should be ICWA cases that are not, children that are in system and not being counted because, and you know, there have been horror stories where 
um, you know, adoptions have been vacated because it was found out last last minute that um, the child was American Indian. So it's a good thing to to advocate for better data systems within the state. And and that's something that the ICWA work group uh, here in Maine we continue to I would say every other meeting it's uh, an issue is brought up where um there's not uh we're not getting noticed early enough from the state of maine whether um to be involved uh with a case when it there is an ICWA or possible the possibility of an ICWA tribe um it's important to remember that the tribes themselves are the ones that determine um eligibility for membership and it's in New York, I believe there's 10 or so uh, federally recognized tribes. Um, and that, here, Maine only has five. Um, uh, New York has 10, um, let alone the people that are moving to the great state of New York um, who may be members of other tribes across the country. Um, it's very important to ask the question early on um, if there's any Native American ancestry. And I think one thing that I, I did as, because uh, I didn't mention either, is um, previous work that Mike was kind of doing too, is working with the ICWA department at, at his tribe, actually. Um, I think one of the biggest things is um, the vibe that I got from a lot of caseworkers is that they didn't want to burden us with letting us know. It's, that's the vibe that I felt. But it was like, no, you guys look, I don't give a crap if it was like the middle of the night and you got to find out somebody's not going to get taken. I want you to let me know because if that's something that can be prevented and that trauma can't can be uh, averted, then yeah. But um, I think that to me, it felt like, um, like I said, it almost felt like the, the state didn't want to burden me with with um, uh, with the follow up or something like that because of, of how busy we were as it as it was. But I think that's one of the, the important aspects of of ICWA work is getting that knowledge out and and making sure that they're eligible for for that protection under that law. But yeah, that's, that's how I I, 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 I took that. I picked I also, up on that too, Luke, as well. When we've done trainings, huh, Esther, where it's like, it, it seems like it becomes a little more work if someone falls under ICWA, that it, it requires like another kind of, like probably more people, probably a little bit more attention. And so, I mean, I, I just want to put that out there. It does, and, and that's why it's really important as well to educate all of the agencies that also interact with uh, the families that are involved in child welfare so that they can be informed about ICWA and they can start asking those questions too. Because sometimes that, that those are the folks that, that uh, sometimes can get more information from families. So it's really important for everyone to be educated about ICWA. And you know, an ICWA case might mean it does mean some more work, um, but it's it's considered the gold standard in child welfare practice and policy for a lot of good reasons. And uh, here in Maine, Bobby Johnson has asked her caseworkers to to have the the standard of of active efforts for all of their cases, which is a you know I, I'm not saying that they're there, but that's that's the goal that she has in mind for them. Um, because it, it, she does recognize how it is best practice. And when you involve the tribe, it makes your job easier because the tribe has access to a lot of services, um, both formal and informal services and supports that, that the state doesn't. So it just makes so much more sense. And, and I, Esther, I think you've made a great point there. Uh, it might be extra work, but it, it's also a large resource for the caseworkers, um, the tribes, they have access to information to um, that might be able to help facilitate the uh, family notification letters that, that go out. Uh, different services that are offered in tribal communities. Um, I know we've been able to be a, um, help with financial resources that um, the state just does not have the the availability to do. Um, so there are a lot of different resources that the tribe can bring to help prevent removal or um, to help with reunification.
Thank you for that. <clears throat> I, I just, oh, go ahead. <clears throat> oh, um, Nathan, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I, I was just, I was looking in the chat as well. I, I, first of all, I wanted to say we're very pro kiddo on the Zoom window here at OCFS, obviously. And it matches the earrings. I mean, come on, it's great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sleeves, perfect. Um, but my question is looking through the chat um, and being the DEI coordinator, I'm really pleased to see so many people jumping to the word ally. You know, as a white ally, how do we do it? What do we do? And I, and I, so I'm seeing different versions of this same sort of question. And I feel like, you know, with the 11 minutes left and all of your lived experience and expertise, um, it, what are some things that we should be aware of that maybe would help us become better allies? What are, I always think about policies we should advocate for. I always think about um, history lessons we should educate ourselves on and language we should use. So those kinds of things, like, can you help us better um, be better? I you think, know, like, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I think language um, is very important and, um, you know, little things like the possessive. I see that a lot in Maine when they're doing reporting. They'll say Maine's tribes or Maine's Indians or, you know, and that some people think, oh, that's not a big deal, but it is a big deal because we don't belong to the state of Maine, you know, <laughs> so pay attention to language and that that um, I think sometimes it, it's it, it is said in a desire to um, to denote kinship or connection, but it really sounds like possession. So uh, be aware of that. Um, you know, and, and the, the word ally is really, it's really interesting because it, I don't know what, I think you saw the short documentary and I can't remember the differences between the two films, but in the film, there's a shot of us talking about this ally training. You know, we were so excited, you know, we're gonna teach people how to be allies, you know, very naive. Um, it came with a lot of, it really blew up in our faces because what had happened was people, just like with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process, white people were so eager to jump to reconciliation and make everything all better um, that it, they kind of skipped over and, and made us invisible, right? We were still invisible in, in our own process in some ways. And so this being an ally, there's such a need to fix it, to make it right, to, to relieve that guilt, to you know, um, it, it just make it right as fast as possible in the le least painful way. And that's not how it works. So what happened is the native people in Wabanaki Reach started getting really burdened by all of these people who were allies. You know, we would do this education with the, the, the this training with them, and then um, they would become saviors and they would start oppressing people in their own group about who was the better ally and who had the, you know, and so it started to become um, a noun instead of a verb and instead of a way to be, it became this label or this badge. And now I have some status because I'm an ally and all of these other kind of, <laughs> kind of layers of stuff. So we, uh, for a while, never, we didn't even use that word um, and really tried to get uh, non-native people, white people in particular to look at themselves and their privilege and figure out who they want to be every day that they wake up and put their feet on the floor. Um, so, but the things you can do, you know, um, if you go to our website, you'll, there's all kinds of resources, but listening to uh, some of our colleagues, our white colleagues in REACH and hearing from them and their process and what they have gone through, um, their number one piece of advice is Keep your mouth shut and list, keep your ears open. When you feel like you want to jump in and help, step back. Jump in and help, be told to step back and be okay with that. I mean, there's, there's no easy way to be in true allyship. Um, some people would say that it's not even allyship that we need. It's We need accomplices, <laughs> people who are willing to... Um, really stand in there and and uh if it's you know if, like it's a war right it's a war zone so there's all kinds of um on the spectrum of what you can do um people some people would say oh you know we don't need money yes we do native groups need money they're really under resourced and underfunded and up against a lot um 
you know, a lot of trauma and working with that trauma every day and trying to do work, it takes twice as much to get as far, you know, as other people. So don't let anyone tell you money is not, is just a, um, a superficial thing. It really means a lot. Um, support and find out what tribes in your state um, are fighting, like in the state of Maine, you know, we, we have uh, all kinds of fights around our fishing rights and water rights, things like that. Find out what the legislators in your state, how they, so which ones support Native people, bring up ICWA to your state legislator. I mean, all of these things that you can do, keep in, um, it just, even if you just focused on ICWA, educate everyone about it. There's a uh, book coming out that just got released, Chris Newell of Pasquaquati, a scholastic book called If You Live During the Plymouth Thanksgiving. It's meant for children. Buy that book, read it to your family at Thanksgiving. <laughs> You know, like anything, truth, healing, and change, anything you can do to learn the truth and share the truth and start letting that truth impact you and figure out who you want to be and who you, what kind of world we want to leave. Like Maria Gerard says, the history we're writing for our grandchildren. So. And Esther, I, I think uh, a couple things to piggyback off you. When, when I'm writing grants and applying for financial resources, it's very challenging to be to compete with the westernized approaches. So we have traditional practices and traditional healings. And when we are trying to find funding for those particular programs, most most opportunities want to see evidence-based practices, uh, peer reviewed, and a lot of that is not available for traditional resources. Um, the our culture and history is passed verbally uh, a lot of times, and, and we know what works for our communities. Um, so finding money is, can be a very can be a very large challenge for traditional things. Um, and I, I completely agree. Following uh, reaching out to the state legislators, um, one of the big things that I am currently working on is trying to get a state level ICWA law on the books because of the challenges uh, to the federal equal law Brackeen case um, and the anti-commandeering statutes that uh, they're pinning a lot of their hopes on. So if we're able to get a state level equal law, uh, that would um, take the winds out of that sail uh, here in Maine. Um, and education is key. Um, and being able, to, being able to educate yourselves and your children on things one of the things that my daughter was attending a public um, elementary school in our town and something as simple as um, uh, a project, they were talking about drugs and alcohol being bad. Um, well, she raised her hand and was like, no, tobacco's not bad. Cigarettes are bad. What my daddy does with the cigarettes are bad. He smokes them. But what I do with my tobacco is I offer a prayer when I pick sweetgrass. That's good. So tobacco's not bad. And empowering and, and education is a, is a huge part. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have to hear from our youngest panelist now, please. The one that's wild <laughs> about mommy. <laughs> She's already that's off. Um, that's daddy's boy. That's not mama's boy. That's daddy's this is boy. That's daddy's boy. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, great. Those are such oh, tangible I'm steps for becoming um, allies. Uh, I, we've, we've got a couple minutes left, so if there's anything really critical that you each want to leave us with, feel free. We'd appreciate it. Um, I would just direct your attention, I'll put it in the chat, to the Tribal Information Exchange. Um, my day job, I work for the Capacity Building Center for tribes and there's all kinds of resources there that are geared for tribal child welfare professionals, but there we have a separate webpage that's on tribal state collaboration that has a lot of good information about, um, about being, a, you know, being a white person and interacting and collaborating with natives as well. Uh, there's a message there from my colleague, Penthea Burns. So that was it. That's a great resource for everyone. Yeah, I'd just like to add, um, 
you know, when you're interested in becoming an ally, it's always good to really kind of like do some internal work prior to reaching out to tribal people to, to have like a real clear, concrete understanding of like what it is that makes you want to be an ally, like wh where that's coming from. And, and so, you know, it as with ICWA and a lot of things, they started out with good intentions, maybe, you know, like we want to save the children. And, and maybe it wasn't well thought out, but, you know, sometimes the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So it's really good to check yourself as a non-Native person to kind of have that like real true understanding of what it is that motivates you to want to help. And, and, and to also, I want to say is like, as Native people, we know how to help ourselves most definitely and to follow our leadership as, as we ask for it, as we ask for that support. Well, Alan. I would like to just thank everyone for their time and willingness and and great questions that they asked people. It's been it's been a great and I feel like things are going in a great direction. Well, certainly we thank you all so much for your time, um, for sharing your history and your stories with us, um, so that we can learn and grow. Uh, and, and really, you know, um, I'll say as a white man learning my place in this world and how it's impacted the lives of a lot of other people and how I can always do a little bit better um, to rectify some of those harms, hopefully. Uh, I think that that's something we all um, societally could work on. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. Uh, I just want to pass it to um, Heather LaForme if she's got any final parting words for us on this uh, awesome Native American Heritage Month event. No, I, I just want to say thank you very much for your presentation today on, you know, your film and your community. Um, it was really, really hard to watch uh, without getting, you know, teary eyed. So, uh, you know, on that note, um, again, Nyawe, and, you know, I wish you well on your travels on back to where you are going. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So this this section was recorded, this Thank panel. You. So we'll be sending this panel out um, to everyone who registered. Uh, and we'll have the link available if people need to uh, see the see Dawn Land at some point later. Uh, uh, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.